The pace of our lives is increasing. Everybody has to try and keep up. In our society, muscle power is not important anymore. Brain power is our capital. Many people are looking for new ways to cope with the increasing pressure to perform. People in leadership positions come to a point where they say, I've got too much to do, and then they ask themselves, how can I keep up? And then they start thinking about taking substances. Can intelligence pills turn the rat race into a brave new world? Studies show that most of us would take performance-enhancing drugs if they were freely available. But what will happen to our society if we start doping our brains? A question we need to find an answer to. Would I have a problem with someone taking a pill that could solve how to eliminate wars, invent, you know, machines that would cure all diseases, uh, transform our lives to make it much better? Well, where's the problem? <laughs> a modern myth says that we only use 10% of our mental capabilities. Is this really true? In research laboratories around the world, neuroscientists look for switches that could fire up the turbo in our heads. Can science provide us with super brains? La mémoire et les fonctions cognitives sont des Memory and cognition are extremely complex brain functions, and we don't know much about how they work. The brain is the most complicated organ of the human body. Before we tinker with it and try to improve its performance, we must understand it first. Some people have an almost unbelievably good memory. Johannes Malo can memorize up to a thousand different numbers or the totally random sequence of playing cards. Johannes is the world memory champion in the category numbers. Man kann sich bei Zahlen you can easily combine numbers with images. For example, everyone thinks of bad luck when they think of the number 13. So I think of a horseshoe. And with 7, you might think of the 7 dwarfs. With 99, you might think of Nina's song of the 99 red balloons. And with 24, you might think of Christmas Eve of Santa Claus. So if I want to remember 99 and 24, I think of Santa Claus flying away with a bunch of balloons. 99, balloons, 24, Santa Claus. So I have an image for each number between 0 and 999. For me, 512 is a blowtorch and 327 are comic books. 519 are spaghetti. 212 is an antenna. So I have an image for each number and then I just make up my stories. Our brain remembers visual images particularly well. The more unusual the image, the longer we remember it. Therefore, Johannes turns numbers into crazy stories. With this method, he can not only remember numbers, in just 30 seconds, he can memorize the sequence of 52 playing cards. Memory champions use their brains very effectively. What can we learn from them? I imagine the brain 
like a vast network in which different areas have specialized tasks and interact with each other. There's an incredible number of connections. There are wide highways, but also small interchanges at which neurons communicate with each other by exchanging signals. Our brain is like a landscape. It has hills, valleys and densely populated areas. Each area has a function. Emotions, movements, memory, everything has a certain place. Billions of neurons communicate via electrical impulses across a vast network of nerve fibers. The brain is the organ that controls everything. It's the body's laboratory. The scientist Isabelle Mansoui studies the brains of mice at the University of Zurich. She has discovered a gene that is responsible for memory formation. In her lab, she breeds genetically modified mice that seem more intelligent than their peers. An intelligent person is someone who understands things quickly, who analyzes situations and uses their wealth of knowledge to draw conclusions and to develop new creative ideas. Intelligence, an obscure idea. There is still no clear definition for intelligence, not even in neuroscience. No one can touch or see intelligence, but we can measure it. Why? Well, you can measure intelligence because it has been agreed that certain intellectual capabilities are considered to be intelligent. geistigen Leistungen sollen als intelligent gelten. Intelligence can be many things. The ability to speak, to memorize, to reason, to think logically and to be creative. So people went and made up tests to measure these capabilities. The result of these tests are added up and in the end you get the intelligence quotient. Intelligenzquotient raus. This game shows how our memory works. It's similar to a notepad. Visual and spatial impressions are stored in the short-term memory and can be retrieved instantly. After use, the information is deleted. After a few days, the player can no longer remember where the cards lay. It is not important to remember everything you have seen or done. You don't need to remember what you had for breakfast on every single day last month. That's why we need a mechanism in our brain to delete unimportant information. Isabel Monsoui explores the genetic basis of our memory to find out more about Alzheimer's disease. During her research, she found a protein that makes us forget. In our brains, it is responsible for deleting information. Isabel Monzoui and her team work with mice. The scientists have modified their genetic makeup, so their brains no longer produce the protein. The delete function is disabled. In this maze, the genetically modified mice need to remember where the sugar cubes are. A mouse with improved learning ability will quickly know where the reward is, the sugar cube, and it will remember that for longer than a normal mouse. Just as people, older mice gradually lose their memory. But the mice that haven't got the protein have a much better memory. The scientists hope to develop drugs against dementia. But healthy people could use these drugs too to improve their performance. However, researchers have just started to understand how our brain works. 
Natürlich stellt man sich als Laie unter Gedächtnis. Most people think of our memory as something very static. I always think of a gravestone with an inscription on it in memory of the deceased, static, carved in stone. But our memory works in a totally different way. Wahrscheinlich völlig anders aufgebaut. Our short-term memory is not good enough for storing information permanently. If we want to memorize things for longer, the information must be transferred into our long-term memory. Sleep is important in forming long-term memories. The neuropsychologist Jan Born has discovered that during the deepest stages of our sleep, our brain works over time. During deep sleep, our brain reactivates the information it has received during the day. This reactivation means that the information is transferred from the short term into the long term memory. There it is linked to other long term memories. Dort bereits im Langzeitspeicher bestehende Gedächtnisinhalte. Even when we sleep, our brain keeps working. Neurons send out electrical waves that can be measured on the scalp. In deep sleep, these waves are very slow and are called delta waves. Jan Born has discovered that these delta waves work like a signaling mechanism. They tell our long-term memory to receive content from our short-term memory. Hence, deep sleep is critical for our mental performance. Students are asked to memorize combinations of words. What happens in their heads when they go to sleep afterwards? I think that by the people I think people who have a very intense deep sleep have a good long-term memory. Children, for example, have a deep sleep with pronounced delta waves. And children have a much better long-term memory than young adults. After the age of 40, deep sleep is very much reduced, and that's accompanied by a loss in long-term memory. Der Verlust der Fähigkeit, langfristig Gedächtnis abspeichern zu können. During the experiment, electrodes on the head record the brain activity. Next door, the researcher monitors the student's sleep. Once deep sleep sets in, this device stimulates delta waves in the brain with a mild electrical current. This amplifies the impulses important for storing the newly learned words. Can the student remember all the word combinations in the morning? We have also an art intensivierung. We have intensified the deep sleep phases through electrical stimulation, and we have found that if we do this after we have asked students to memorize words, they will remember them much better. Some of them were actually able to memorize the vocabulary perfectly. Be perfect, be smarter, faster, more focused. Does our brain need help from outside to cope with the growing demands?
an dem Ziel, sich zu verbessern, Enhancement zu betreiben. The desire to become better is nothing bad, of course. Since the beginning of mankind, people have tried to outdo themselves. Und ich denke, dass wir But now, we have a new situation where we have new technologies that make it possible to achieve things in a completely different way. Many of us can become part of this, for instance, by taking certain drugs that are widely available. And these medications are much easier to use than, for example, stimulation procedures. Already, drugs are on sale that can improve concentration. They have been developed for people suffering from the attention disorder ADHD or the sleeping sickness narcolepsy. But they also work in healthy individuals. With neuroenhancers, that is substances that can enhance your mental performance, you need to distinguish between substances that are freely available, such as coffee, caffeine and ginkgo, and substances that are prescription only or even illegal. The best known enhancers are modafinil and ritalin. In the US, they have become fashionable drugs. In Europe, they need to be prescribed by a doctor and cannot simply be bought in a pharmacy. But you can get them over the internet, even though this is illegal. The enhancers have sparked a discussion about brain stimulants. We know, however, that the effects of neuroenhancers in healthy individuals vary a lot and are usually overestimated. The psychiatrist Klaus Lieb wants to find out what neuroenhancers can actually do. So far, there have been very few studies on healthy subjects. He tests three different drugs on professional chess players. Ritalin, the illegal amphetamine, and caffeine. Does the chess player's performance change under the influence of these drugs? And how do they affect the brain? Node points handle the signal transmission between the nerve cells in the brain. They are called synapses. Chemical messengers such as dopamine, ensure that information is transmitted quickly from one nerve ending to the next. This is where neuroenhancers step in. The stimulants, like the amphetamine or the methylphenidate, the ritalin, block certain... The stimulants, like amphetamines or ritalin, block specific areas of these node points and thereby prevent messenger molecules, like dopamine, that have been released to be reabsorbed into the nerve cells. Hence, these substances are available in larger doses and have a bigger effect. Professional chess players are ideal subjects for Klaus Lieb because their mental skills are measurable and easily comparable. Chess clubs are extremely interested in the results of this study. As a sport, Chess is subject to the guidelines of the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA. So far, there is no evidence that it is possible to dope in chess at all. Playing chess is not just a cognitive achievement, but also a creative performance. So we are looking at improving a very complex intellectual effort. And actually, my hypothesis is that by taking neuroenhancers, you are upsetting such a delicate balance between creativity and knowledge that you don't improve your performance at all. 
So your performance is likely to be poorer. Problematisch ist also, dass die eher schlechter werden in der Leistung. The chess experiment is still being evaluated. The outcome will depend on how enhancers influence creativity. But what is creativity? And can it be artificially improved? Artists could not work without creativity. But it's difficult to grasp. Inspiration cannot be forced. What is the artistic process? When I paint, I immerse myself. I restrict my view and focus on the object before me. And around this object is a great void. I don't think a lot. I've read that creativity has got nothing to do with thinking, so I'm in a constant stream of perceiving and creating. Often things happen that I only notice afterwards. And I'm happy when I look at my day's work and ask myself, how did I get there? Brain researchers also want to know where creativity comes from. Is it part of our intelligence? So far, it's been believed that creativity is far too complex to be improved artificially. A brain researcher in Sydney now wants to prove the opposite. For me, creativity is taking an idea from seemingly unrelated places, putting them together and magically making something new out of them, a new idea, making us look at the world in a new light. That's creative. I come from a creative family. My brother is a, uh, a sculptor, a pre de Rome sculptor, and the other brother is a Jackson Park Prize winner a painter, and I'm a scientist. Although some people think I'm more uh, something else. <laughs> At the University of Sydney, Snyder runs his own brain research laboratory. His theories are provocative and hardly disputed. For the past 10 years, he's been interested in whether technical manipulation can make the brain more creative. We all look at the world through filters. And one way to show that we look at the world through filters is Consider how we draw. If the normal person draws, they draw not what they see. They draw a caricature of what they know. If you draw a ball, no one will draw a ball. They'll draw a circle. The healthy, normal person looks at the world through the filters of what we know. Two people look at the cloud. The ultrasound sonographer sees a diseased gallbladder. The portrait painter sees a face of dignity. We don't see what's out there. We project what we know on everything. And can you see that's a bottleneck to creativity? Here's a typical drawing of a four and a half year old girl. She draws not what she sees. She draws a symbol of what she knows, a horse in this instance. Now someone the same age draws like that. How can that be? Did she have more than this girl had in some way? No, she had less. She's autistic. Nadia, the girl, autistic girl who did this, had privileged access to the raw, unprocessed information that exists in all our minds, but before it got packaged up into holistic concepts and labels. The apparent creativity of autistic people who lack these filters is an important key to Snyder's experiments. By magnetic stimulation, he tries to make a healthy student as creative as some people suffering from autism. 
Oversimplifying, the left side of the brain stores concepts and previous knowledge. The right side, however, is responsible for the new and unknown. Magnetic waves inhibit the communication of the neurons on the left. This allows the creative side of the brain to work better. We're not enhancing areas of the brain responsible for art. We're not enhancing parts of the brain responsible for intuition or insight. What we're doing is turning off part of the brain. It's a radically different idea to allow the filters, the top-down filters of perception to be removed, to allow a free view of the world. I love this quote by William Blake. If the doors of perception were removed, you would see the infinite. In other words, it would be like a telephone book. You'd have too much information, you'd understand nothing. So we need those filters, but we pay a price for them. Every day we see, hear, and smell millions of things and forget most of them. But recognizing other people is vital. We are social beings. We define ourselves by interacting with our peers. We are intelligent because we communicate intelligently with others. With mice it's similar. Their behavior can be easily examined. In Zurich, the scientists test the social memory of their genetically modified mice. La souris est un modèle expérimental extrêmement précieux et très utile. The mouse is an extremely useful test animal because it can develop a memory about things and events like we do. Just as we can recognize our children and our families, mice can recognize their fellows by smell and other characteristics. Exactement comme un homme ou une femme va reconnaître ses enfants ou ses membres de la famille. Mice are curious. They're most interested in other mice they haven't met before. The scientists use this for an experiment. The mouse that can walk around freely is the mouse that we want to test. The other two mice are sitting in their containers and cannot move around much. So this mouse has a choice with which of these two mice it wants to spend time. This is a social recognition test based on the principle that the mouse remembers which animal it already knows. And the better its memory is, the more time it will spend with the unfamiliar animal. The test shows that the genetically engineered mice remember their fellow mice three times longer. But do they have an advantage? Es ist in den letzten during the last three decades, it has become increasingly clear that emotional factors are important for being successful. For example, at work. It is not only important to have intellectual skills, but it's also important to have what we call emotional intelligence. But what is emotional intelligence? Recognizing and analyzing our own emotions and those of others is essential for our social lifestyle. We can only communicate with others if we sense and show emotions. Emotional intelligence includes the ability to control one's own emotions. We can only act rationally if we are able to feel and control our own anger, despair and joy. At the Freie Universität Berlin, students are asked to interpret emotions shown in film clips. Can we artificially improve our emotional intelligence? 
The researchers are looking for a substance that increases our compassion. Here, they test the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is a protein that's produced in the brain. Some people call it the love hormone. Oxytocin in animals leads to a closer bond with a partner, to an increased feeling of trust. So there are many indications that oxytocin can actually modify our emotions. A sensor detects even the slightest variation in the student's emotions because the electrical resistance of the skin changes. Marie does not know whether she has taken oxytocin or simply saline solution. While she watches the film clips, she automatically shows emotions that are recorded by a computer. The researchers hope to develop a drug that can help autistic people detect the emotions of others. A spray that enhances our compassion could become a top seller for healthy people too, to optimize their social skills. More and more drugs developed for neurological diseases have the potential to become neural enhancers. But drugs are not the only way to optimize our mental performance. Thousands of years ago, people have started developing means to keep our brains fit. A person meditating has an object on which he focuses and he tries to keep the attention there. But anybody who has ever done this knows that after a few seconds your attention drifts away. Some more exciting ideas pop up in your head and lead you away from the object of your meditation. It is this process, noticing that you drift away and guiding your attention back to your object of meditation, that the meditator goes through again and again. And this trains the areas associated with attentiveness. For years, Ulrich Ott has been studying what happens in the brains of people meditating and how the brain improves with training. Does meditation really have a measurable effect on the brain? With his fellow researchers at the University of Gießen, Ott uses a scanner to look inside the brains of students practicing meditation. Three months ago, this student meditated for the first time in her life. Today, magnetic resonance imaging will show whether her brain has changed since then. The scanner is so powerful that our camera must remain at the door. If we went inside, its electronic circuits would be damaged. For people, however, the magnetic field is safe. Es gibt inzwischen schon eine ganze Reihe von Untersuchungen, wo man verglichen hat das Gehirn von Personen mit Meditationserfahrung. There is quite a number of studies that have compared the brains of people who meditate to those who don't. Andere Übungen auch. We assume that meditation, just like any other regular exercise, leaves traces in the brain. Take playing the piano, for example. If you practice regularly, then the brain regions responsible for representing the movement of hands and fingers grow. Because you need to perform much more sophisticated movement patterns than a normal person who doesn't practice. In recent years, scientists have started to examine the brains of Buddhist monks. Does daily meditation exercise really change the structure of our brains?
the purpose of meditation is to strengthen your concentration when you concentrate there's tension when you begin to meditate you have tension and concentration together so when you meditate little bit more the tension goes away and concentration remains The scanner takes hundreds of images of the brain. These images are later assembled into a three-dimensional figure. The magnetic resonance images have yielded a sensational discovery. Our brains are constantly changing. Every experience, every conversation affects the chemistry of our heads. New nodes between nerve cells are formed, the synapses. Because of their color, they're called gray matter. Man hat es auch sehr schön zeigen können beim Jonglieren, ja, wenn sie jetzt anfangen jonglieren zu lernen. Juggling is another good example. If you learn how to juggle, you might not like it at first, but after a while you can coordinate the eye and hand movements much better. The coordination of these three-dimensional movements challenges your brain and it responds by amassing grey substance in the corresponding areas. It makes new connections between nerve cells that are already there and they become more differentiated. Ulrich Ott and his students think that it doesn't take a lot of meditation to visibly alter the brain. An American study has shown that after only eight weeks of intensive practice, the brain starts to form new gray matter. The brain is very complex in its neurochemistry. There are studies that show that meditation can cause an increase in the release of certain substances like dopamine. I suspect that we can achieve many of the effects of drugs in a more natural way through meditation herbeiführen kann durch bestimmte Meditationstechniken. Our brain can be trained like a muscle. Memory champion Johannes Malo uses a clever trick to remember the order of playing cards. The method of Loki from Latin places even the old Romans knew about it. The method of Loki works by determining certain locations in your home. So you walk around your house and you see, okay, first comes the couch, then the TV, then the bookcase, and then the table. And then you combine these points with the things you want to remember. We want to memorize a shopping list containing milk, fish, apple and parsley. We now combine these items with certain points in our home. We imagine milk running down the door. The crazier the image, the better we keep it in our head. The fish swims through the picture hanging on the wall. In the supermarket, we will certainly remember that. Next, the apples. In our minds, we stack them in the bookcase. We let parsley grow out of our chair. This example has only four stations, but Johannes uses roots with up to 2,000 points. The brain associates. We all know this. We smell a scent and suddenly remember a story that happened a decade ago. Or we walk past a park bench and suddenly remember somebody we met there or somebody who slept on it, just because of the trigger, park bench. And then the brain associates. And this is how it works. Associate things and connect them to things you already know.
C'est évidemment positif d'avoir une meilleure mémoire, d'être capable de se souvenir des, des informations. Of course, it is good to have a better memory and to remember things longer. But this can also have a negative effect if the information memorized is traumatic. Isabelle Monsui's team investigates the limits of superbrains. What are the potential side effects? A genetically modified mouse is placed in a box where it will have an unpleasant experience. A standard test in which anxiety is associated with a particular place. Johannes Boacek applies a light electric shock to the mouse's pores. If you put the mouse back into the same box, it will show fear. The researchers compare the behavior of the two mice a few days after the shock. The mouse, with a genetically improved memory, appears passive and intimidated. Watching the monitors, Johannes Bohacek checks the movement patterns of the two mice. The one on the right has apparently forgotten the shock and moves about freely. Yet the one on the left, the one with the super memory, barely moves, a sign of fear. Une souris, uh, avec un super cerveau, ne pourra pas a mouse with a super brain cannot control its fear and won't forget the shock until the end of its life. What price are we willing to pay for a more efficient brain? The mouse experiment shows what could happen to us. Scientists are exploring whether too much knowledge can be damaging. Are there limits to optimization? Can we become too clever and too perfect? One of the bottlenecks to creativity is being blinded by your expertise. You can have too much expertise. We're all experts at, at, at what we do, we're experts at language, and it blinds us to the unfamiliar. In a new experiment, Snyder and his PhD student Richard Chi want to open our eyes and show us creative solutions that we simply didn't see. Simone must correct mathematical equations by moving only a single matchstick. One after the other, Simone corrects 30 equations. Each time she does it faster. The solution, however, is always the same. Simone is an expert for one particular problem. There are many examples of being blinded by expertise. Chess players, apparently, this is very interesting, novices often see moves that experts don't see, but grandmasters do see. It's called the Einstein effect. So you have something experts miss, a novice sees, and a grandmaster sees. Now Simone gets a new task. Again, she must correct an equation, but this time she fails. Why can't she find the solution although the task isn't harder than the one before. We made Simone an expert. She was an expert at changing 10 to 5, and an expert at changing 5 to 10 with the matchsticks. But when we gave her a plus, she was having trouble changing it to an equal sign. The expert now needs to forget her previous knowledge to be open for new solutions. Using a weak electrical current, Snyder blocks Simone's left half of the brain and stimulates the right, creative half. We did this matchstick experiment with 60 people and we had three times as many people 
solve the, the difficult problem with transcranial direct current stimulation than with the control group. It gave us the idea that perhaps one day you could even have a thinking cap. Now, not really a thinking cap, a kind of creativity cap, one that allows you more important than thinking, rather allows you to look at the world afresh. Because look, look, we all have Google. We, we don't need more information, right? What we need is a way to take information that's out there in different places and put it together in a novel way to join the dots up, not the way they used to be, but some novel new way. Is our brain fit for the future? Until now, the dream of learning effortlessly has remained just that, a dream. This is what makes enhancers so attractive. What's wrong with taking intelligence pills? If there was a substance that could, for example, very selectively improve my memory for vocabulary, so I could learn a language like Chinese easily, I think I would take it. But there are no drugs without side effects. Anxiety, Depression and insomnia are among the side effects of neuroenhancers. Es gibt für uns gute Gründe zu sagen, um, die Einnahme von Neuro There are good reasons why we say that taking neuroenhancers does not make much sense. The effects are usually negligible. And if you take stimulants such as amphetamine or Ritalin, you run the risk of becoming addicted. And we have good alternatives. Und wir haben gute Alternativen. Es gibt Studien, die zeigen, dass das Trinken von Kaffee. There are studies that show that drinking coffee has a similar effect to taking Ritalin or other substances. So drink coffee that's safer and healthier. Sicherer und gesünder. Wir wissen ja heute, dass die Wirkung von den, den psychoaktiven Substanzen, die wir von außen zuführen, Psychoactive substances work because our brain has synapses that are sensitive to them. This means that in this vast chemical laboratory up here, there are enough natural substances that we only need to set free. I am very skeptical about taking a pill and improving a specific function, because we can achieve this in a natural way by training our brain. This is more sustainable and we don't get addicted. Entsprechend uns üben in in der in der Funktion und dann ist das viel dauerhafter und wir sind nicht abhängig. discovery phases of our research. This is not something that ordinary people should put electrical current in their head. No, that's not a good idea. These are proof of principle ideas. It reminds me of someone coming into your room in 1880 or something and saying they have a, a thing called a radio. And you say, let me listen to it. And they say, okay, you're in Sydney, Australia. And I have someone in London singing for you, and you hear them singing, and it's terrible, it's all crackly, and it's just terrible, and you say, that's horrible. But the point is, that's proof of principle. You could hear a signal from all the way from, from London to Sydney, Australia. Terrible sound, but my God, look at the potential. Maybe one day it could be fixed up, and maybe one day you could actually hear a signal going around the world crystal clear. Well, the same with the transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and transcranial direct current stimulation. We, we have you know, not a perfectly clear signal, but we have an indication that we can do this. It's phenomenal. I mean... Until now, enhancers don't work very well. So why the hype? 
Is it artificially fueled by the pharmaceutical industry trying to create a future market? Penser qu'un jour on pourra euh, développer un, une drogue ou un médicament. The idea that we might one day develop a drug that makes us more intelligent is wrong. There might be drugs that can increase our attention, our concentration, and perhaps also our memory. But nobody can make people smarter. To achieve any cognitive improvement is simply unrealistic. Unsere Botschaft ist eigentlich ganz allgemein zu verstehen, weil bei uns natürlich in unserer Gesellschaft die Tendenz herrscht. Our message is very simple. In our society, there's a tendency to view sleep as a waste of time. And I think it's enough that people realize how important sleep is in forming their consciousness and shaping their memory.